so rich, so good, so magnificent. Let us taste and see today that God is good. Amen. Father, we open wide every part of our beings. We say you are welcome in. Go to the deepest places, oh God. Touch us. We want to be conformed to the image of your Son. Jesus is the important one. So our eyes, let them be fixed upon you, God. Let us recognize the magnificence, the wonder, the awe of who you are. Woo! Yay, yay! Yay, yay! Yay! Woo! Aha, 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 yay! We just <laughs> want you. Who? Oh. We just want you. Yeah. We just want you. We just want you. We just want you. We just want you. That's why we're here, oh God. We just want you. We just want you. You're the one, you're the one, you're the one. Yes, you are. You're the only one. welcome you here this morning. We welcome all those that are online. But the one we welcome the most is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Ha <laughs> ha. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're the worthy one. Yes, you are. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're the worthy one. How you doing, huh? God's doing really, really good. So he's just going to pour out some of his goodness on you. You ready for that? Pour it out, pour it out, pour it out, Lord. Pour it out. Pour yourself out on us. Woo! It's going to hot, getting hot in the kitchen. <laughs> do it too fast. Heat up here, it's hard to do it slow, you know what I mean? Raise a hallelujah, present of my enemies.
of you are alive this morning because God is alive. Yes, Jay, you're alive because God is alive. Manasseh, wherever you are, you're alive because God is alive. And every one of us are alive because Jesus is alive. Yes, he is. <laughs> Let's do the chorus again, you want to? your week's been like, you know, some of you had a roller coaster, some of you may have felt like you fell off in the ditch, but it's good to be here today, because the presence of God is here, the presence of God is here because you're worshiping Him, and you're praising Him, and you're giving Him thanks, so thank you for being who you are. makes what we get to do a whole lot easier with people like you. So thank you very much. <laughs> you know, in, in Psalm, uh, I just Ooh. lost it, 19.1, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. How many of you know what's happening tomorrow there's a sign and a wonder that's in the skies it also talks about it in um, oh it's Psalm 96 I believe 97 97 97 verse 6 it talks about the the heavens declare the righteousness of God (laughs) the times and seasons he put in order from the beginning of creation and so as we sing this next song the heavens declare remember he set everything in order as a sign and a wonder and a a notice of appointments that we have with him. So the heavens declare your righteousness, God. Love it when God shows off. Amen. Do it. Just 
to the Lamb. Blessing and honor and glory and power to you. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen.
angels Son of man The voice of many waters Song of heaven's throne Louder than the thunder Make your glory known Hail, hail, Lion of Judah Let the lion roar Hail, hail, Lion of Judah let the lion roar, hail, hail, lion of Judah. Let the lion roar, hail, hail, lion of Judah. Let the lion
morning you hadn't let a roar out now's a good time to do it yeah now's a good time anything that's attacked your lungs a roar will cause it to run <laughs>
This is the day that the Lord has made. So don't mess it up. Okay. Great. Thank you for that worship. I was staying in the back today because uh, I had the worst case of hay fever I've ever had. Matter of fact, it may be the worst case in the history of the world. <laughs> I never had hay fever. And, uh, but just in case it was something else, I, I'm not going to shake hands. I may bump hands if you want to bump hands. But I'm gonna, as soon as I finish this message, I'm going to bolt so I don't give you what I've got. Now, <clears throat> you're welcome. Give what I've got from the message, and then I'm getting out of here. But, uh, you know, I'm sharing a what I think is a basic vision of church and church life, and you know what it is. It's growing up in all things into Jesus. It's as simple as that. But, you know, last week we talked about how he is the resurrection and the apostolic gospel was they preached Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. And then they went about demonstrating it. They became his witnesses. And that word witness there is a legal term that would be used in court for someone who was an actual eyewitness. And these were those who were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. They had seen him, and they went about demonstrating his resurrection with power, that he was still alive. He's still doing everything today that he did when he walked the earth. He wants to do everything he did when he walked the earth right here in this congregation. 
Now, we may still be a little bit too big as a congregation. You, you know, there's a, a sense that we have to be uh, of a certain size for God to use us. Uh, I would just want to challenge that in you, okay? Um, I had, in 2014, I had an all-day encounter with the Lord. And um, one of the things he asked me, you know, in our early days of ministry, we were doing conferences all over the country called Unity Conferences. And we wouldn't even go to a city unless a large percentage of the churches in that city came together to invite us. And um, if they did, we would go, and we had some great conferences. Drew a lot of people, saw some amazing things. And then in 2014, now this was way back in the early 90s, we did those. In 2014, Lord said, how much unity came out of those conferences? I'm going, wow. <laughs> That's what we were doing them for. Well, how much unity did you leave in those cities? And I thought about it and I said, I'm not sure we did any. I'm not sure we left anything. He says, you know why? You tried to get too many together. Didn't he say, he's, he is the one who mentioned this to me. He said, didn't I say that if just two or three are gathered, there I will be in the midst of them. And he said, have you ever considered that if there are more than that, I'm not going to be there? I said, Lord, I have never thought of that. He said, if you'd have started with two or three small congregations, they could have connected with each other. They would have developed relationships. And it would have been the birthing of something that could result in unity of the churches in that city. But, you know, we were doing it the opposite way, trying to get all the churches together. There's way too many people. So <clears throat> one concept I want you to have of new covenant, church life, it usually starts with two or three or with a tiny group. Now I believe we can reverse engineer and get there. And that is by taking large congregations and just try to build what we call fire teams. Any of you in the infantry or the Marine Corps, the Army, what were you in? Okay, good. Welcome. Thank you for your service. Okay. Now, I was in the real military. I was in the Navy. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. But uh, <clears throat> I had to go through Marine Corps infantry training to be a part of a ground defense force. And one of the first thing they did, they broke us up and set us up into what they called fire teams. Three, maybe four person teams. Several of these teams would make up a squad. Several of these would make up a platoon and et cetera. That, that was a basic construction. But your most basic unity or, um, you know, um, form of, of your, uh, you know, I'm searching for the word, this happens when you get over 70. But um, your, your basic organization was around the three or four person fire team. And it was usually only four people if a machine gun was involved. The others, it was just you and your weapons. Um, but it worked. And pretty soon you bonded with your fire team. You bonded with your you know, platoon, and you all learn to work together on that basic thing. We need to do that as a church. 
And instead of starting a prayer group where we want everybody to show up, everyone to come, we need to hope only two or three come. You know, as Francis Fran Japan used to say, prayer and poker have the same rules. Four of a kind beats a full house. And it does. Unity in prayer is far more powerful than a lot of it. Okay? So, you know, one of the things we're hoping happens is many small groups, power teams, start bonding together. And that God will use you in many various ways that we can go out and do exploits. But we want to go out and be witnesses of his resurrection. Remember the first place in scripture that it's mentioned that God had a house was when Jacob had the dream of the ladder reaching into heaven. And the theological principle of first mention where something's first mentioned, that's a profound revelation of its purpose. <coughs> I think that was a revelation that the primary purpose of the church is to be the place of access to heaven. Where the messengers of God are ascending into heaven and returning to the earth. They go up and down, but returning to the earth with evidence of heaven's reality. That's how Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. He would go about and say, you know, in heaven we don't have any cripples. Watch what happens when the power, the authority of heaven touches this cripple. You know, in heaven we have no lack. We've got all these hungry people here that don't have food. Watch what happens when the authority of heaven touches this little boy's lunch. That's the kind of of abundance we want to walk in. You know, there's more power in any born-again, spirit-filled Christian than in any army on the face of the earth. Do you realize that? Who lives in us? And this is it. This is what the apostles were preaching that released such power. We know he's alive. He is risen. He told us to go out and do all this stuff, and he's doing it. You know, there was a time when Peter said Peter's shadow would touch people and they'd be healed. You know, in the if you read that in passage in the Greek, it wasn't a shadow. It was an outshining. They translated it shadow, but something was emanating from Peter. I believe it was a, a token of Isaiah 60, where it says, Arise, shine, for your light is come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you, for behold, darkness will cover the earth. And that's what's happening right now. It's covering the earth, and deep darkness the people, but his glory is going to appear upon you. I believe that was happening with Peter. People knew whatever that is, you get touched by that, it's going to heal you. It's going to fix whatever's wrong. Okay? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, he is the whole gospel. He's the whole purpose of God. It says in Ephesians 1 that all things are going to be summed up in him. You know, the ultimate goal of God for you is that your whole life be summed up in him. What does that look like? What does that look like? Now, you know, also says in place like uh, Hebrews 6, when it talks about the seven basic doctrines of the faith, it says leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, we go on to maturity. Now, he's not saying leave the teachings of Christ, saying leave the elementary ones. And going to the more advanced ones. It's all about him. As we see later, remember what did Jesus say when he said to Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree? He said, whoa, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. 
He said, you're, you're amazed by that? You're going to see greater things than that? You're going to see the messengers of God, same word for angel, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, him. So if we don't keep our attention on the ultimate purpose of God, that all things are to be summed up in him, we will continually be distracted by the lesser purposes of God. <coughs> Excuse me. If, well, you know, there are many have not, who have not even been led to the Lord. They were led to the church. Many who were led to a doctrine are many of the things of God, but not to God. What good is the most glorious temple if there's no God in it? And if there is a God in it, it's not going to be the temple that gets your attention. It's going to be God. So if the temple, if the church is getting so much attention, what does that say about us? You know, I remember one time when we, we prayed for one of our conferences for the Lord to show up, that he would anoint the messages, would anoint the worship, would anoint the ministry, the prophetic, everything else there, more than we had ever experienced. But we asked that he would show up in such a way that no one would leave talking about the messages, talking about our preaching, or the worship, or, you know, all the miracles or whatever else, but they would leave captivated by him. Imagine. And we had no idea what we were asking or how he would do it, but that's what we felt to ask for. Some of you may have been there. The last session, right at the end of the last session, when a pillar of cloud appeared right in the middle of the stage. We were in the highest worship we may have still ever experienced at Morningstar. I mean, it was off the charts. People were out of control worshiping. And when that cloud appeared, you can hear it on the CD called Glory, how every all that stops. People were screaming to the top of their voice, worshiping God. And it instantly goes silent. That's because they're going, whoa, what is that? I had been turned around. I had a two-year-old son. I was I lifted up to play the kettle drums. I'd given him the things and pound on the kettle drums. And uh, I was focused on him when all of a sudden I felt this. It was a stronger presence of the Lord than I'd ever felt. It felt like a nuclear fire. It started burning from the inside out. And I turned around, and I see a cloud. And I assume something's on fire. I put heat, cloud, smoke, and <laughs> we're on fire. <clears throat> and then I just made the decision, you know, we got several thousand people here. We got to get out of this room. There's a fire here. And then I just said, no, nah, let it burn. The presence of the Lord is so strong here, I'm not going to do anything. And that was a good call. Because it wasn't a fire. It was, the Lord, just one little token. And then the clouds started moving horizontally across the stage. And uh, you could hear on the CD at the end of it, people wailing, crying, trying to pray, trying to intercede, whatever. But it was just, no, wait a minute. And you know what? Everybody left that conference. Nobody was talking about our great preaching. <laughs> the worship had been the best we had ever experienced by far. And nobody left talking about that. At least for a while later, they would talk about it some. But everybody was captivated. God came. He showed up. And uh, as a, 
you know, we pro tried to process why did he show up as a cloud? Why this? And I think it was just evidence how whenever they offered a sacrifice that was acceptable to the Lord, it would go up in fire. That it was just a token from him, I've received this worship. And, uh, but what can we do in our lives? Are we pointing to him? Are we leading people to him? To me, the greatest example of New Covenant ministry is John the Baptist. He was the bridge. His whole goal was to prepare people for the Lord and then to point to him and then know how to get out of the way when the one who was greater had come. And to me, that's the basic foundation of all true ministry. Our job is to prepare people for the Lord, lead them to him, their own relationship to him, and then be willing to decrease as he increases in their life. Do what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, someone captured a real cheap video thing because the tape had one, run out 10 minutes before that appeared. And I think that was the Lord's will. <laughs> we would have sold the fire out of that tape. <laughs> you know, but he said, nope, I got a bigger purpose. Okay, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Many come to know the way. A few more go on to know truth. Not many go on to know him as their life. And if we don't know him as our life, we don't really know the way or truth either. Because the way is not a path, not a course. It's a person. Truth is not just getting our doctrines right and added upright. Truth is a person. We want right doctrines. We want to be on the course. But we're only going to be on the course and have right doctrines if we're following a person, Jesus, and he becomes our life. Amen. Now, this is what we're after. This has to take place with each of us personally. And then I believe there are small fellowships where you really bond with a small group of people where there, there can be something happen. As I shared a few weeks ago, you know, where it says, if we abide in the light as he is in the light, we have kinonia. One of the main words used for church is translated church or fellowship, but it's a word that means the fellowship that comes by being bonded together as a family. Now, ecclesia, the other main word that's used, that's an organization and government. And uh, we need that too, but if we build on that first, we're not going to have the latter. Why would he say that? You know, the main things, do we have kingdom? I think we've got to become a family before we, can, we're, we need to worry about organization too much. And if we do start organizing, let's think about these small groups, home groups. I know where we've done this and where I think it is succeeding. Uh, pretty soon the home groups get so anointed, the small groups, that I, I know we've had people on our leadership team that really became worried that these become a church. So be it. Isn't that what we're doing? Well, they may not relate to Morningstar. Who cares? That's less for us to have to worry about take over, take care of. Do you understand? We're trying to build the kingdom, not Morningstar. If they become a separate, unique church, thank God. That's fruit. We want to bless them and help them as much as we can because we want to bless the kingdom and one of the fundamental core values we have as a ministry is we want to see ourselves as a part of the whole church, 
not just not try to think of ourselves as the whole church. We're a little part. Okay? So <clears throat> our main thing is to grow up in all things into him. I think the more we see him, the more we're going to be compelled that I don't care how exciting a church becomes. It does not have anything compared to the excitement of just the smallest encounter with him. And the church is supposed to be the place where we do that and where we can ascend into the heavenly realm, which is supposed to be our true home, and bring back to the earth evidence of heaven's reality and its authority over the earth. Okay? Jesus is the resurrection. Now, this is a little bit of review from last week because I'm trying to hammer these things home. If these don't get home, if these aren't the main things that we're focused on as a body, you know, we're just going to be another franchise, just another thing out there. What would happen if just two or three people start really walking in this? You would have Stevens rising up all the time, whose power and authority in the Lord actually eclipsed that of the apostles for a time, where a deacon can walk in the most extraordinary things, and where it can happen to anybody through every anybody. It you know the thing that encourages me most is when I hear about miracles that didn't happen in church what we call church, in the service, that it's out there in the world. Didn't Jesus do most of his ministry in the world? In daily life? We just gather like this to encourage one another, bless one another, pray for each other, support each other, you know, and seek that kinania fellowship where there's the bonding together but then we go out into the world. Our main place of being a Christian is supposed to be Monday through Saturday. Not on Sunday. If our church life doesn't make a difference on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, it's, something's wrong. Something's really wrong. Now, we talked about, <clears throat> remember when Lazarus died and... Um, Martha heard that Jesus was coming, and she ran out to meet him and said, Lord, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened to my brother. He said, that's okay, Martha. He's going to rise again on the last day. And she said, oh, yeah, I know he's going to rise again on the last day. I, uh, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke that. He didn't say we know that Lazarus is going to rise again on the last day. He said he's going to rise again. And she said, oh, yeah, I know he will on the last day. He didn't say on the last day. And so she could see him in the past. If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. And in the future, on the last day, you're going to do it. He said, Martha, I am the resurrection. I am. And that's his name. It's not I was. It's not I will be. It's I am. We must know him in the presence. We should be experiencing him as much or more on Monday morning as we do Sunday morning. Same on Tuesday morning. Every day we, we've got to walk and he's got to be our life. And <clears throat> I shared about how the Lord, one of the first things he ever, I, when I heard the voice of the Lord, one of the things he said was, he was crucified between two thieves, yesterday and tomorrow. And I understood. One of them was in bondage to his past, and the other one to the future. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. He said, I'll remember you today. Today you will be with me in paradise. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. I am. His name is I am. Not I was, not I will be. Now, I believe one of the biggest thieves of Christians is they're in bondage to the past. I have had so many Christians tell me, I'll never go back to church. I said, why? 
I got hurt there. Everybody gets hurt there. What are you talking about? It's not filled with people. People hurt people. Are you crazy? You know, when there were just two brothers on the whole earth, they couldn't get along. One of them basically said, this earth isn't big enough for the both of us. Now, people do that to each other. And you know what? It can be worse in the church. And God allows it. Why? So we can learn to love. Learn to forgive. Some of the basics of Christianity. It's a quarry where he's fashioning us into the image of his son. The whole purpose of everything. If you haven't been disappointed by the church, yeah, I don't know where you've been. <laughs> People are going to disappoint you. They're going to fall short. Even the best intended. Yeah, that just comes with the territory. And guess what? It's going to happen just as much in, out there in the world as it is here. Usually a lot more. Eventually we grow. And then I've heard people say, well, yeah, when the church finally gets its act together, I'll come back. <laughs> I said, no, you won't. The church will be so far down the road, you'll never find them. And you will not have gone through the process they got to, that maturity that they got to dealing with all this stuff. You wouldn't fit in. You couldn't find your way in. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Get where you're supposed to be and just say, I'm going to ride it out. And guess what? Didn't Paul say in Acts 14.22, through many tribulations shall we enter the kingdom of God. Okay? That to me says in every trial, every tribulation, there's a gateway to the kingdom. A doorway to the kingdom. Have you ever thought of that? Now, James said, count it all joy when you encounter trials. I don't know many people do that, but that's scripture. It's a command. If those who are mature do, they count it all joy. And then, you know, Peter said, testing of our faith is more valuable than gold, which means that we should get more excited about a test than we would if we found a bag of gold. Those with true maturity, true vision and understanding the kingdom of God, that's true. So when someone offends you, you know, when someone, you know, uh, falls short in what they've obligated themselves is, they disappoint you or whatever, that's an opportunity. There's a gateway to the kingdom there. When are we going to start using those gateways? Like I said, you never fail one of God's tests. You just keep taking them until you pass. And too many Christians are going around and around circles in their wilderness because they don't pass the test. So they have to take it again. You're not going to get past it until you win, until you succeed and pass the test. All right, so we need to embrace these things. And <clears throat> I tell you, some of the people I dislike the most when I first met them, became the most important people in my life. I have a history of that. I don't know if it's that way with everyone, but it's sure been that way with me. And I probably was the one many people disliked the most too. I may have been that one. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm glad I stuck it out. I'm so glad I stuck it out. And so we've got to have this thing that all of these trials are opportunities. And we're not going to let what happened in the past ruin our entire future. You know, we're going to actually be real Christians and start forgiving each other. 
Isn't that basic Christianity? So every time we get an opportunity to forgive, we grow in forgiveness. We grow in love. We grow in all these things. Didn't it say even about Jesus? What did it say about? He learned obedience from the things that he suffered. If you, we've got to understand this suffering is a way to learn obedience. <clears throat> now, I don't like suffering. You know, I don't know anyone that really does. There may be some weirdos. I just haven't met them. But my philosophy is no pain, no pain. I hate pain. I don't want it. I'm going to avoid it at every opportunity. But we're not avoiding it when we run from it when it happens. When it happens, I want to count it as a bag of gold. And know that I can grow through it. And uh, I know when I said I had the worst case of hay fever, if you came up through the faith camp, you probably said that was a negative confession. It was a positive confession. I'm positive I was that sick. <laughs> but I want to be true. I want to be honest. I can't get healed until I under till I acknowledge I need healing. You know, some people take scripture here and there. You know, one that I think ruins more Christian lives than any other I know. Two places in scripture, it, it is told, the Lord said, stand and see the salvation of God. You don't have to do anything. There's two places. There are about 200 when they had to fight for their victory. I have seen many Christians suffer shipwreck because they got in a trial and they said, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to defend myself. And that may be a good thing to do, but I'm just going to stand and see the salvation of God. Well, <clears throat> that's an extreme exception. Another basic theological principle is you never base your basic, you know, theological foundation or your basic walk on the extremes in Scripture. You base them on the weight of Scripture, the weight of the teaching of Scripture, but these extremes are there for a reason. There may be time when you come to the battle of your life and the Lord says, I don't want you to do anything. But I tell you, I want to hear that loud and clear. I want, to, I want it on paper, sign God. You know, I'm saying we need to hear clear to embrace the extremes. And otherwise, we should realize we got to fight. We don't fight the way others do or for the same things, with the same weapons. We fight with different, all that, but we're going to have to fight. How about the New Testament? How many times in the New Testament... Was it the apostles defending themselves against accusations and all? A lot of our New Testament's made up of that. Do you hear what I'm saying? So many Christians take the extreme, the dramatic, and base their walk or their life on that, and they suffer shipwreck after shipwreck and can't understand why they keep fighting. Well, let's... Be a biblical people first. We're going to, you know, our default will be to go to the weight of Scripture, the weight of the teaching of Scripture, but always be open for God to do something unique and extreme. You got that? It's just the way it is. <clears throat> but there's so many things in there like that. But this is why we've got to follow a person. Not just principles. Okay? The New Testament was not meant to be another law. Some people try to make it into another law. They'll use phrases like, that's not biblical. Meaning, if you can't find it in Scripture, you can't do it. That's making the New Testament into another law. 
That's not the way the Lord intended the New Testament to be used. It was meant to free us to do whatever's not specifically forbidden. Okay, we're free to do it. That doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it God. But you're free to try it. And if you make a mistake, he can bail you out. He can do a lot of things. And usually will. But you hear what I'm saying? We want to promote freedom. But don't blame me for it, for what you do. Uh, Okay, I get set free too. The leaders of the church get set free too. You know, but uh, <clears throat> we've got to follow a person. Jesus, the lamb. He's the one we're growing up in all things into Christ. And ultimately, if we mature as the body we're supposed to be, he will be manifested so much here You'll never leave a meeting talking about the preaching. You'll never leave a meeting talking about anything that happened there. You'll leave it knowing you had an encounter with the Lord. He's in his temple. And he's the one you will be drawn to. And he's the one you'll be thinking of. And then as we come together, it will be even more powerful. And the church is meant to be that light and that, you know, uh, a outpost of the kingdom of God and the place of access to heaven. But we'll never get there if we preach the church. We'll never become the church we're called to be if we preach the church. Do you know that? It's by preaching Christ they became what they were called to be. Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. And like I said, as you know, Spurgeon said about the resurrection. He said, very few Christians believe in the resurrection. And I thought that was a mistake. I thought it was a misprint, actually. The Holy Spirit witnessed to me, said, no, it's still true. They, m- most Christians believe in a doctrine of the resurrection. But if they really believed in their heart, and it says in Romans 10, 10, it's in our hearts that it results in righteousness, believing in our hearts. He said our lives would be radically different than they are. We would not be consumed with the temporary issues of this life. The biggest problems would be small if we were consumed with the kingdom. And if we saw the kingdom, I know people that every day all they can think about are all the ways that this world has fallen apart. Guess what? That's a sign of the coming kingdom. That's Daniel 2. When that little rock strikes the foot of the statue, represents all man's kingdoms, they're all coming down. But that little rock's going to grow into a mountain, which is a government. You know the kingdom government is being formed in the earth right now? And then it's going to fill the earth. Okay, so... If, you, if we are looking more for the kingdom than we are looking at the problems, we're going to see the kingdom is coming. It's in our midst. It's here because the king is here, and we want to help that. Part of our job is to help build a highway, as it says in Isaiah 40, for the kingdom, for the king. We're here, and that highway is God's higher way. Okay. Well, you guys, all, some of you are thinking, sometimes I can hear your thoughts. And you're thinking, you forgot the offering. <laughs> Listen, in Haggai, it says the gold is his and the silver is his. So if you've got any of it, will you bring it up here and put it in there, those <laughs> baskets? <laughs> now I'm just saying we do take up an offering that's how we keep this thing going if you'd like to be a part of this offering uh, make your checks out to the gathering and, um, and at your whim you know, it's a time for you to get up and stretch I'm not going to go much longer but 
As soon as I see these baskets full, I'll stop. <laughs> Here she comes, the first one. Here comes the second. <laughs> okay. She gave me permission not to stop. But I didn't want to hold any of you back from doing what... Okay. Great. Okay, so this message was most, mostly watering the seeds I tried to plant last. You get that. There's going to be a lot of that. And, uh, and what's coming on. But we've got to focus on the Lord. And we've got to focus on seven days a week. We're the church seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And the Lord can use us to prophesy just as much Wednesday morning as Sunday morning. And one of the things we want to do, and we'll get to doing, you guys think I forgot all about the tables like I forgot about the offering. (laughs) Didn't forget. Just had to get a few of these conferences out of the way so they didn't have to move them all in, move them out. But I think they're out of the way now. Tables are coming. And what can happen, I think it will happen, is you will still start connecting with people on a new level. You cannot have Kenania looking at the back of someone's head. And this meeting is not just for Kenania. It's a general meeting, a big one, where the doctrine, the preaching is done and all of this. But... Uh, <clears throat> The orientation will be towards smaller groups. Things springing up. We're going to have a lot of teaching on warfare, intercession. This is where we begin. I know in the military, first thing we were taught, how to stand watch. And everybody on the ship stood watch. Everybody in the squadron had their place for standing watch. And... uh, and we're going to get down to that, and that will help us to, uh, you know, walk in what we're called to be, church life, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We should always be on watch. Now, there were times when you stood watch, where you were signed a post to stand it there, <coughs> but then... At any time, if you saw anything wrong, you were trained to see them and to communicate to the right people. (laughs) Now, we want to do that, but first there needs to be a basic change in what we've got to see as the high calling of God Christ Jesus. Okay? Okay where this is all for things here, but it's also there is a high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read it to you in the scripture. (coughs) But I think it's one place articulated. More than that, Philippians 3, starting with verse 8, more than that, Paul's writing, I count all things to be lost, in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. You know, Paul was from one of the wealthiest families in the time world at the time. You remember when King Agrippa kept wanting to converse with Paul because he's hoping Paul would give him money? He knew Paul's family. This guy was incredibly wealthy, and here he's saying, I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them but rubbish. Actually, in the Greek, it's a little more graphic. Count them as rubbish and order them. I I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. We've got to do this. 
If we're true believers in him and the resurrection, it's going to manifest in our life. The power of his resurrection. I will eventually get healed of hay fever, the cold. I've seen miracles. I've seen a lot of them. But why is it we can't get people healed from colds? I think it's easier to heal stage four cancer (laughs) than some of these simple things. Uh, That's a diversion, excuse me. But we do want to know the power of his resurrection. I am now determined. I'm going to get, I've got a personal enemy in hay fever. Okay. I want to see a victory of me, but I want to see it in others. When Jesus, we're healed by his stripes. Very place he was wounded, he received authority for healing others. Very places we're wounded, it's not God just trying to hurt us. He's trying to give us authority. Do you understand? When Paul's authority was challenged, as we talked about last week, how did he defend his apostleship? He talked about his sufferings. When Moses asked to see the Lord's glory, what did the Lord show him? His back, his stripes. He was crucified from the foundation of the world. We need to understand the power of suffering. It's not arbitrary. It's not God just punishing us or doing these hurtful things to us. He's trying to give us authority. This thing has got me really mad at hay fever. And if it's some whatever it is, I'm going to get mad at it. And we've got to have a victory over it. All right? We want to see the power of his resurrection because we're witnesses and we believe in the resurrection. And then it says, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not not that I've already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. What was he talking about? He wasn't talking about salvation. He was saved the day he believed in the atonement of Jesus on the cross. He wasn't talking about salvation. He wasn't talking about eternal life. He's talking about something beyond these things. He said, brother, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, like this is the entire focus of my life now. This one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's Christian maturity. Yeah. Have you ever noticed, didn't Paul, when he was a young apostle, say, I am not inferior to the most eminent apostles? <coughs> Later he writes, I'm the least of the apostles. <laughs> then he writes, I'm the least of the saints. And one of the last epistles, he says, I'm the greatest of sinners. It's Paul the Apostle. Do you see a trend there? With increasing maturity, there's increasing humility. <clears throat> we need to acknowledge where we are, how much, of, how much we need him. We need his help. It's nothing of ourselves. Our righteousness is not going to be of ourselves. Guess what? Your faith is not going to save you. It can, a lot of things will happen. You know, it can happen because of faith. But it's not faith in your faith that saves you. It's faith in him. That's true faith. And a lot of have reduced faith to being a faith in ourselves. A faith in our faith. 
Faith is simply recognizing the one in whom we believe, who he is and where he sits. That's faith. You have that kind of faith, you will be saved. You have that kind of faith, you'll be saved. So, but one of the things, you know, I look at the opportunity that we have here, being small, being, you know, a lot of diverse, weird people, (laughs) you know, uh, God could really do something here. He was born in a stable. He still likes to be born in the most unlikely places. We wouldn't even put our animals in the stables they had then. But this is our opportunity. You know, didn't Azusa Street, possibly the greatest, highest impact revival of all time? Actually, you could argue it's still going on. It's just moved. It's gone to a lot of places that are just one. Started with a half dozen people that wanted God more than they wanted oxygen. They were the poorest of the poor. Dirt poor doesn't even describe how poor they were. They didn't care. They wanted God. And they saw some of the most spectacular evidence of his resurrection. I must continue. Have you ever read about all the miracles that took place there? Now, I've been in places, I've seen amputated limbs that were restored and stuff like that. I remember God started moving one conference. We had teeth that were missing started popping in people's mouths. It sounded like popcorn. And, you know, we've seen a lot of that. Gold teeth. Then just gold. Things, and these are little touches. He said, listen, you know, uh, this is nothing. This is nothing. You know, when the Moses part of the Red Sea, the angels were bored. So we have seen him do so much greater stuff than this. We saw him stretch out the heavens like a tent curtain. And you don't even know how big these heavens are. Okay. Let's know him and the power of his resurrection. It's our calling. Just a few here get it. The world's going to be a path to your door. Just a few. It doesn't take many. Where he is really manifested, they'll come. But that's not why we do it. We do it because we want him. All right, Jerry, I think we have someone. Jay has a little testimony he wanted to share about the power of his resurrection. Thank you, sir. I'll help you down. No, do you want to get up here? Uh Uh-uh. Okay, go ahead. Right here. Go I, here. I need to watch you so I can grab the mic. If you okay. <laughs> here, I'll stand real close in. Okay, so most of you guys know me. I'm Jay Hill. You know, I've been going here for about uh, seven and a half years right now. Well, last Saturday I found myself in a unique situation. I was on the dirt in the midst of having a heart attack. I'm not suggesting... Anybody should do that, by the way, brother. But um, I'm not suggesting that for anybody, okay? But what I want to really tell you about is the power of his resurrection. As I was going through that, Jerry was with me. My wife was with me. Kyle was with me. Um, Jerry and my wife were with me at the, when it was bad, okay? And I was never afraid. Amen. Not one millisecond was I ever afraid Within about an hour after my wife had started contacting people, I remember saying this prayer to God, and I said, Lord, if I'm going to see you today, I want you to make it really quick-like, because I don't want to lay around here for hours waiting to come and see you. 
But if you still have things for me to do here on this earth, I want you to spare my life. And at that time, this peace came upon me. I can't even tell you. And joy. Okay, Jerry can tell you, we were in there laughing and joking with the cardiologists and the doctors when they were coming in because this peace and joy that settled on me. Because I, a long time ago, had settled in my mind, Jesus got up out of the grave. I'm going to get up out of the grave. And his goodness is not determined on whether I live through this heart attack or not. His goodness was determined because his son came here. He died. He was crucified. He was raised from the dead. He's at the right hand of God right now. And he's going to come back and get me. If I'm absent from this body, I'm going to be present with the Lord. And if that was going to happen that day, I was totally okay with that. Within 36 hours, the doctors were coming into my room down there in Winston going, why are you here? We don't even know why you're here right now. What are you doing here? Within four, from 48 hours to 96 hours, I never saw a cardiologist. I'd see them go by on doing their rounds because I had met them. They'd look in the door and they'd keep walking. I'm not, I asked my wife. I said, Judy, what's going on? She said, they're afraid of the light. They're repelled of the light. They knew that when they came in my room, I was going to give glory to God and testify of what he had done. You can't find anything in my heart right now. I have no high blood pressure. I I don't have cholesterol. I don't have blockages. There's nothing in there. And it confounded them. They couldn't understand what happened. But I knew what happened. And I just wanted to thank all of you guys for praying for me. I want to thank you, Jesus, for who you are, for everything that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, what you need to do, you've got authority over that. Anyone got a heart problem? He's right over here. What we need to see is if the things we go through immediately embrace, if some trial comes upon you like this, say, Lord's give me authority over heart issues. You get hit with a disease or sickness, he's giving you authority over something. Seek to see the power of his resurrection manifested. Lord, I just pray right now for everyone here. Lord, we ask you to see you, who you are, and where you sit. And that our vision would be fixed upon you. You would be the ones, the one that we're following. And Lord, that any trial that comes upon us this week in any way, Lord, let us see your purpose, what you're seeking to work into us. What authority, what maturity you're seeking to work into us. And Lord, that we might start right then to manifest and to pray for others that we see with these same afflictions. Lord, thank you. Let us see your authority come forth in this body as your authority comes forth in our own individual personal lives. In Jesus' name, amen. He's doing everything today he ever did. He wants to use his people. So, go and sin no more. Go and thin no more. Go eat lunch. (laughs) Amen. Thank you.